Okay, welcome to today's Storer Lecture, which will be given by Professor Paul Falkowski at Rutgers University. Quick intro, uh, so Paul is a distinguished professor in the Bennett L. Smith Chair in Business and Natural Resources in the Departments of Earth and Planetary Science and Marine and Coastal Sciences at Rutgers. He's also a Board of Governors Professor and a Director of the Rutgers Energy Institute. Uh, as you'll see, Paul's research program is very broad. He works on everything from phytoplankton to evolution, biogeochemical cycles, astrobiology. And uh, he always gives fascinating lectures, which I, I first learned about at the, I would regularly go to the photosynthesis Gordon conferences, which are focused mostly on the light reactions of photosynthesis. And year after year, there'd be talks like, uh, EPR indoor show the manganese oxidation states of the OEC. And then there'd be a talk about a manganese X-ray edge fluorescence shows that there's a manganese oxidation change from S2 to S3. And there'd be another talk saying a reinterpretation of the XF shows that there's no oxidation state change. It's just metal ligand covalency changes. And then there'd be another talk, new synchrotron method Show, that's immune to ligand covalency changes show that there's a manganese oxidation state. So this gets to be horrible after a while. And the worst thing is, many times those talks were from me. <laughs> <laughs> he knows it. So, so occasionally, or often, the chair of the Gordon Conference would be smart enough to have a session where he could invite or she could invite Paul. It would used to be like photosynthesis on a global scale. And then Paul would talk and we'd all go, Oh, I didn't know that. That's really fascinating. So those were much better talks than the ones we were given. <laughs> so uh, I think you'll see this. And then most recently, uh, I saw Paul at the Metals in Biology Garden Conference. We've been having more things about like metalloenzyme evolution and global scale things. And so Paul talked at just this last Gordon Conference. And after that, I had the idea that we should get him up here for a story lecture. So that's great. So. Um, just a quick history, Paul grew up in New York City and went to City College for a bachelor's and a master's. And then he moved way over to Vancouver to do a PhD in biology at University of British Columbia. After a short postdoc at University of Rhode Island, uh, Brookhaven National Labs opened a Department of Oceanography and Paul moved there as a staff scientist in 76. And he was there almost 20 years before he moved to Rutgers. So uh, he's been in Rutgers since then. And when I, you know, if you, pull, if you go to Paul's Wikipedia page, for example, you see an incredible list of awards. And if I go through all the awards, we'll be here another five minutes instead of listening to Paul talk. I just mentioned that he was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 2007. And the most recent award that I know of was a, he won the 2018 Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement, a co-recipient of that which is for work on increasing our scientific understanding of how Earth's climate works. So that's a very prestigious award, so congratulations on that. So I have to say, some of you heard me say this, but uh, when you introduce people who have a list of awards like this, like Paul does, you can go through them all. But at one time I asked, uh, I asked my friend Harry Gray at Caltech what to do in that circumstance. And Harry said, what you should do is say he's a great guy Sit down and shut up. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dave. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'll turn this off so we don't get the feedback. Wow. Oh, can you hear me? Huh? Yeah. Yes. All right. Um, so for many years, um, I've been thinking about how electrons move in life. And if you think about people in the chemistry department or a biochemistry department, we isolate uh, an individual protein, and we put in a substrate, and you get a product, and we're very happy if we can get an electron moving to a protein, and we make something. But that's not how nature evolved. Nature evolved within organisms, electron transport chains, to generate metabolism. And then it evolved a process where my gas is shared with your gases and other gases on the planet. 
and we form a circuit of life. So that's what I really want to talk about. And I'm, while I'm at it, I'm going to sell a book. So uh, if you're interested in this subject, I wrote a popular science book called Life's Engines, How uh, Microbes Made Earth Habitable. And so I know many people uh, in Davis and my university and many other universities think about plants and animals. But the reality of it is that most plants are wood, they're dead, and uh, totally irrelevant to metabolism. They're just supporting structures. And if you then take the second largest amount of biomass on the planet, it's microbial. All right, now, <clears throat> my work uh, that I'm going to describe today is mostly funded by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. And there are a few people up here that I want to acknowledge. Uh, Vic Nanda, I've been working with for uh, about 15 years. And he's a structural biologist and a, a very good colleague. And David Case, uh, many of you know David Case wrote The Amber Code, or re helped to write The Amber Code. And uh, some of you know Deb Ashish uh, Bhattacharya, who's an evolutionary biologist. And a lot of the work I'm going to describe is by one of my former students and postdocs who now works at Bell Labs, is John Kim up there, a very, very, very talented uh, uh, chemist. I want to begin with this very simple, uh, apparently simple slide. So <clears throat> this is the lifelong work of Victor Goldschmidt. And all the geologists learned this in first year geology. So who was Victor Goldschmidt? Victor Goldschmidt was a born in Switzerland. He was a Swiss Jew. And when he was around eight, his father, who was a professor, uh, was made an offer in, to come to the University of, uh, of Oslo. So the family moved to Norway. So Victor spent the rest of his uh, working career, or early working career, in Norway. I'm not going to go into the gory details, but the, the point is that um, he loved Norway, and he was obsessed, obsessed with the distribution of elements in the universe. That's, um, so he was arrested twice by the Gestapo during the war. Uh, the second time, uh, he was actually freed by MI6 uh, in, in, uh, and taken to England. He was very famous at that time. He spent the rest of the war years in England. But after the war, uh, the English tried to give him a position at uh, one of the great universities in Cambridge, uh, great colleges in Cambridge. And he decided not to do that. He went back and spent the rest of his life in, in Oslo. Now, let's just take a look at <clears throat> this distribution of elements, which um, there are two elements up here. There was hydrogen and helium, which are formed in the Big Bang. And so those elements are about 13.9 billion years old. All the rest of those elements, with a very small amount of lithium, all the rest of the elements, all the rest of the elements are not formed in a normal star. They're formed in the supernova, which is a very short lived very hot star. And there are many classes of supernova. I'm not going to go into the gory details. But the point is that within those supernova, you get fusion reactions leading from helium to, for example, carbon. And it has to go through a lithium beryllium boron hole. And that lithium beryllium boron hole is formed because those nuclei are relatively uh, highly destroyed at high temperatures. They don't not well preserved. How we get carbon is actually, that, that turned out to be uh, Beta's, one of his great contributions to cosmochemistry, figuring out how carbon was made. But then you see a very funny thing, odd even, odd even. So carbon, uh, we can call six protons, nitrogen seven, oxygen eight, and so on. So every single one of those reactions that leads to fusions of helium has to lead to a deep one single either acquisition or loss of a proton through either radioactive decay or spallation. And so we get this odd even distribution of these elements. And then we come up to the last of a series in cold stars, cooler uh, of the supernova, which leads us to the end of the road, which would be iron. And iron is the most abundant transition element that is formed by these reactions. Uh, and it's scaled, by the way, to uh, silica at log 6. This is a log abundance scale. And then if you get to a hotter supernova, you will find a decay all the way out to two radioactive isotopes or elements. That's uranium and thorium. And I just want to point out here that there are two sources of energy. So the first source of energy is fusion reactions in our star or any star. That's hydrogen and helium. And the second is radioactive decay in Earth's core, in our core, in rocky cores, uh, cores of rocky planets. And that's from uranium, thorium, and potassium-40. So that's a heat engine. 
Now, uh, just for the students that are here, you see there are several, uh, two elements that are missing. Uh, it's 43, and I think it's 62. Are those elements formed? Yes, no? Students, just grad students. Yes, no? Yes. No. The answer is yes. They have no stable isotopes. They all radioactively decay. So if you think about this, why is lead high here? Higher than, for example, mercury? That's a decay product from uranium and thorium. And that's how we came to date the age of the Earth. Not we, Claire Patterson down the street at Caltech did this as a graduate student. All right, so the age of the Earth is dated at 4.56 billion years old. That's, that's how old we are. Now, for, um, for the first half of Earth's history, let's, I'm going to go over here. This is the way we teach it in geology, usually. If this is the origin of the Earth, I go up to about here. This is early bombardment. The moon is formed. We get oceans. And this is called the Hadean period. We have very, very, very small amount of rock on the planet that is from this period of Earth's history. Very small. Most of it's in the Canadian Shield. It's relatively worthless. At four billion years, we make arbitrarily, actually, as it turns out, arbitrarily a distinction. We call this period now from four billion to 2.5 billion. I'm going to walk up to roughly here. This is called the Archean. Now we know we have life on Earth. It starts about here. We have pretty good evidence of early microbial life. There isn't an animal or a plant on the planet. There isn't a continent. There's only ocean. We start to get freeboard of continents about here. OK, so this is called the Proterozoic, the early zoic, early life. Then we walk and walk and walk and walk and walk and walk, and I'm out to here. Now we see the first animals the very first animals. The oldest animal fossil we have is 635 million years. And I'm going to walk to here. And now you see the first plants on land. And I'm going to walk to here, and here, and here, and here. And this mount here, that, I'm not even sure it's that wide, is the existence of human beings. I just want to give you a scale of how things work. Now, the origin of life. This is what my colleague in England, Nick Lane, my friend, calls in the vital question, the black hole of biology. So we understand it's an invention of non-equilibrium, and that's a thermodynamic reaction problem. If oxidation reduction reactions, moving of electrons with or without protons that involves five of the so-called big six elements, so it's H, C, N, O, P, and S, you can rearrange this if you uh, didn't take a geology course or a biogeochemistry course. You can put the C in front of the H, and it spells schnapps. So you don't have to remember very much except to spell schnapps with a C. OK? Now, there's one element up here of the, the six, and that's P, that for all intents and purposes is the only one of those six elements that does not undergo oxidation reduction reactions. It's acid-base chemistry. And I want to put this in perspective for you. Um, <clears throat> so if we take a look at those six elements, hydrogen is by far the most abundant. Then we come to carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. We're roughly about the same. There's a, some, some uh, planets and some stars will have a little bit more carbon than oxygen and or a little bit more like us, oxygen than carbon. And uh, by the by, for those of you who are not planetary scientists, everything beyond helium is called by this, the astronomers a metal. So they talk about the metallicity of a planet. They're talking about everything that's heavier than helium. Obviously, they didn't take chemistry. So um, then we come along and move along. And you see sulfur up there and phosphorus. So phosphorus is inevitably going to be just by the mechanism by which it's formed in, in, in a supernova, the least abundant of the big six elements. Now, one other point I want to make 
because we're moving electrons around, life is electric. And I don't mean this as a metaphor. I mean this really literally. Life is electric. So all organisms, this is beyond doubt, derive energy for growth and maintenance by moving electrons from a substrate to a product. And this, you'll see, is really interesting. Now, ultimately, all the products and substrates have to be recycled. So therefore, biological processes are paired. And we can think of it this way. We can think of it like half cells in redox reactions, if you're a chemist, that photosynthesis is a half cell and respiration is another half cell. But they're not just reverses of the reactions, OK? So it's, there's a different chemistry that is going on between photosynthesis and aerobic respiration, or oxygenic photosynthesis, to be more precise. Now, in the Archean Ocean, so remember where we are? So we're starting at 4.5 billion, and we're going to walk up to 2.5 billion. And the 2.5 billion is not arbitrary now. This is a, a what's called an unconformity in geology. This is a geological boundary. In the Archean Ocean, the sources of electrons for life were hydrogen gas. Iron, too, was a big source. Hydrogen sulfide and organic matter itself. Now, where did the organic matter come from? This is kind of a circular argument, you would think. The organic matter is delivered to Earth all the time by chondritic meteorites and meteorites in general. But chondritic meteorites have lots of organic matter in them. They have 90 amino acids. They have purines, pyrimidines. There's a lot of stuff. They don't have sugars. Now, today, the sources of electrons are liquid water. So there, we're the only planet in our solar system that today has liquid water on its surface. There was certainly liquid water on the surface of Mars 3.2 billion years ago. Whether there was liquid water on Venus is uh, unknown. Venus is one of those very, very strange planets that does not have a magnetic field to any great extent. Um, so it doesn't have a dynamo. And its surface has been remodeled by extensive volcanism. So if you're sitting on the surface of Mars, I mean of Venus, you're under 96 bar pressure of carbon dioxide. 96 bars of pressure is as if you were at 1,000 meters in the ocean. If I put you in 1,000 meters in the ocean, I don't care. Even John Voss, who's a big guy, would be squeezed to about this big. OK? So we would have a, a little baby John Voss. All right, now, it's so hot, it is so hot on Venus today, there's no liquid water. And um, one of the big problems is if you put a lander on it, the solder and all the other things that are electronic components melt within a very short period of time. So we don't know very much. We can't walk around Venus like we can walk around Mars. Now, let's just take a look and put some things in perspective for that liquid water. So this is an exact, this is a, an Apollo 8 image from a Hasselblad taken by an astronaut of Earth. And yes, it is 71% of the surface of the planet is water. And uh, it's very impressive. So Carl Sagan called this the pale blue dot in a very famous essay that he wrote and a narration that he made. But if I took all that liquid water and I put it into a bowl, that's it. That's the total volume of liquid water on the planet. It's nothing. As my wife would say, it's bupkis. So it's amazing that we have maintained in this scenario of Earth's history so far, a place where liquid water has remained on the surface of the planet from 4.34 billion years. That's slightly after we popped the moon out of Earth. We have pretty good evidence that there was liquid water from the isotopic ratios of zircons, which are small granules that we can recover from that age of, of the Earth. And yet, where did that water come from? We're not exactly sure. The closest bet is that the water was delivered to Earth by meteorites. If you ask an oceanographer where the water came from, they'd go, huh? Most, 
We don't really know with certainty. Now, I'm going to point out why liquid water and the atmosphere of the Earth are interesting. This is an image at the top of the atmosphere in the black showing the spectrum. And this is not noise. Why, why do we have these lines? Students, what, what are these lines? What are these lines? They're very famous, very famous. Those are the Fraunhofer lines. When you look at our sun, you will see images in the, in the spectra of lines being obliterated in the continuous spectra of should be a perfect black body, right? But you have iron, you have helium. Helium was discovered before it was identified on Earth from the spectra of the sun. That's why it's called helium. Okay? So there are many elements of the corona of our star which were captured dust or captured materials from the origin of our solar system that is leftover debris from the supernova that exploded before our solar system was formed. Now, let's take a look at this. Top of the atmosphere, and there is at surface, uh, that's the surface of the atmosphere. I'm going out in Davis. This is the spectrum that you would measure, and you see these now, these bands of absorption, and those are gases. Water, carbon dioxide, for example, the two main ones today. And then I just want to point out one thing to you, because this is very counterintuitive to many people. So I'm going 10 meters below the surface of the ocean, and you see that the ultraviolet radiation and blue radiation is barely absorbed. It's the red radiation that's attenuated very rapidly. Now, why do I care about that? You see this gap between the top of the atmosphere and the surface of the planet today? That's solar radiation in the ultraviolet that is now missing. But in the Archean, that was not missing. That was there. Why is it missing today? Because we have one gas in the atmosphere that absorbs in that wavelength, those wavelengths, and that's ozone. So prior to oxygenic photosynthesis and the production of oxygen, molecular oxygen, we had no ozone, and I can prove that to you another way, but let's just point out that um, we, we, didn't have, we didn't have that gas, we had UV light. Now, why do I get to that? Because I'm going to start this story off with abiological photoreactions. I'm going to start this off moving electrons around without life. And that may be a bit weird. So this is, if I get this going, all right, this is a synthetic mineral which we make in the lab because we could, it's very difficult actually to, to generate it today on Earth because there's oxygen. It's called siderite. So siderite is iron carbonate. If I took a piece of chalk, that's calcium carbonate. You eat Tums for the tummy, that's magnesium carbonate. All I'm doing is substituting an iron 2 for the calcium 2 or the magnesium 2, and I'm making a carbonate, which is this sort of grayish material. And it has an anti-bonding orbital. So DFT, the density functional theory, will allow you to calculate the anti-bonding orbital from the spectrum. And it's at 280 so odd nanometers. It's 4.8 electron volts. So I can populate that anti-bonding orbital with light. And here I just put an ultraviolet light onto that in a target. And you see that orange, orange circle? We've oxidized there. Iron 2 to iron 3. Now, if you're a chemist, you follow the electron. Where did it go? And we're showing you, it's a little hard to see with this light on, but it's what you see here are these little holes after a few hours of irradiation. We're generating, as you'll see in a minute, hydrogen gas. And we've made a new mineral. So this is the siderite. This is just a magnet, a little bar magnet. That siderite, once it's all consumed, becomes magnetite. Cool. So you make hydrogen gas, and you make magnetite. Now, the reaction is a bit weird. So I went over this many times with Fraser Armstrong. It goes through an iron-1 intermediate. I'm not going to bother you with this, but it's a two-photon reaction. 
And we're generating huge amounts of hydrogen this way. And you can do this with many elements. You can do this with manganese. You can do it with copper. And why do I care about that? Because once you generate a gas, you've generated potentially a substrate for biology. Now, I will assert, without evidence for the moment, and I'll come back to this in a bit, that biology co-opted these kinds of reactions and used metals, transition metals specifically, to generate hydrogen originally as protons and electrons later, and then use that to fix carbon dioxide in one of the very initial processes of life. It could have been done without light at hydrothermal vents, but at some point this had to move out into the upper portion of the Earth. And the primary driver by far is the power supply of Earth is the sun. So Vladimir Vernadsky wrote a book in 1926. It was published in Russian. Vernadsky is the father of biogeochemistry. And he asserted, and I think it was a very prescient uh, observation, or at least uh, conclusion, that all living organisms exchange a gas with their environment via redox reactions, via electron transfer reactions. So let's take a look at you and me. We take a breath, right? Every breath we take. On the exhale, we're breathing out two gases, water and carbon dioxide. So we've reduced the oxygen with electrons and protons derived from sugars or food that we ate to water. Where did the oxygen come from originally? It came from water. So we'll get into that in a bit. So many of the core metabolic processes are related to gas exchange. Now I'm going to talk about this on a very simple level first, and then it'll become a little bit harder in a second. But let's just make it very simple. So let's just take oxygenic photosynthesis, and I'm going to write it in a complete way as a, just a simple reaction of water plus carbon dioxide is going to go to uh, sugar, in this case, and, and oxygen. And you and I have just done this, right? So we're reducing the oxygen back to water, and we're oxidizing the carbohydrate or the sugar back to uh, carbon dioxide. All right, now, we're in an atmosphere of 21% oxygen. So if I have an atmosphere of 21% oxygen and everything was balanced on a planetary scale, we would never generate oxygen gas. In order to generate oxygen gas, you have to take the reduced sugar, the sugar up there, the candy. You have to hide it from the children. So you have to put it in a lockbox. You, you cannot let the children find the candy. Okay? Does that make sense to you? All right. Now, before I get into that, because this is going to be the easier part, because it's more, you're more aware of it through Dave and others in the, this, this university, there were nanomachines that were evolutionary selected. And I, I'm just going to point out the most complex of these is this machinery, which contains two reaction centers, a intermediate electron transfer reaction of a cytochrome, and an ATPase, and all of these machines work, and I'm not uh, in, in movement. So the front end of this machine, we're extracting the electrons out of water with photons and oxidizing, uh, a man uh, oxidizing water to oxygen and reducing manganese atoms through four successive electron transfer reactions, four photons. One, this is one of the Einstein rules, one photon, one electron. You can't get one photon, two electron transfers. Now, the, the working end of that machine is really, really, really complicated. And I'm just going to point out to you that that manganese cluster is in a structure that we know quite well now. It contains four manganese atoms, uh, one calcium atom, and oxo bridges. We don't know where it came from. It's a singleton. It occurred once, or we find it once in nature. All the attempts to make this before are extinct that we see. So that's the only machinery, no matter what, that splits water on the planet. 
and it's found in cyanobacteria, and it's found in phytoplankton. And I just want to point out to you here, it's only found in one clade of prokaryotes in the planet. That's the cyanobacteria, one single clade. This clade was subsumed by other organisms to become plastids across the eukaryotic tree of life. And there you see land plants that are related to green algae or very closely descended from green algae, one single green alga, by the by. And then you have red alga, you have glycophyte alga, blah, 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 diatoms, dinoflagellates, yada, yada, yada. So a diatom contains, for example, the same metabolic machinery for splitting water, but it's not related to land plants, except very distantly. So when we talk about algae, they're not plants. They have the same metabolic pathways, but they're different and very diverse. And by the by, I like to point out that in this schema, which I get from Sandy Balduf a while back, but I, I just like it, it, it. It's basically correct. You see animals. So we're an animal here. We're very closely related to fungi, which I can find very, very true when I teach freshman chemistry. So. All right, now, life on this planet can be seen from space. These are false color images, but we try to keep the idea going. So green is more, and yellow is less on land. Blue is, and green are more in the ocean, and red is very much less in the ocean. These are composites of what's called sea whiffs images. And there are two, two signals from here that would tell you, without having coming down to the surface of the planet, that there's life on Earth. The first is the seasonality of this. We're greening in the northern hemisphere in our summers and greening in the southern hemisphere in the austral summer. So that cycle is a very strong signal of life. The second is not so obvious, and that is chlorophyll fluoresces, and we can detect the fluorescence from space in the ocean. It's not so easy from land, by the by. And that, that fluorescence signal is a sign of life. So those two signals are, are, are really, really interesting, and we can discuss that later if you like. Now, when we take a look at this, I'm just going to point this out, that the biomass of the ocean is 0.2% photosynthetic biomass of the ocean, only 0.2% of the total bio, photosynthetic biomass on land. So you have 600 gigatons of, or peta, ten to the petagrams, uh, the same thing, uh, of, of carbon in terrestrial biomass and one petagram approximately in marine photosynthetic biomass. But look at the nitrogen, the net productivity. So the ocean produces about 46% of the planetary oxygen. And the land produces about 54% of the oxygen. Why? Because in the ocean, all the phytoplankton biomass turns over about once every five days. It grows like crazy, but it turns over. It doesn't accumulate. Whereas on land, it turns over only once a decade. And that's because we're biasing this, in a sense, because we're counting grasses, which turn over once a year on, on approximately, compared to trees, which turn over once a century. Now, I'm going to go back to how we got the candy stored. So we're making candy. Some of in the ocean, let's just go back to the ocean, because that's where we start. Some of that organic matter sinks. So we form these cells, and they sink. And some small fraction of them will get to the deep sea. And I'm going to point this out in a sense. Let me skip this slide for a second. I'm going to go back to it. It sinks to shallow seas and continental margins in the present world. And that's why we have repositories of oil in what were formerly sh shallow seas, like Saudi Arabia or the inland waterways of the United States from uh, Alberta, for example, through Montana, Oklahoma, Texas, down to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and there are many places which were formerly shallow seas with are now the repositories of organic matter. Now, I had lunch with some students today, and they didn't know about this cycle. And this is the critical one. When that organic matter sinks on shallow seas, there is a cycle which was described by the late Twozo Wilson at Toronto. And we start out, we only need to know two things in physics here, uh, the Archimedes principle and heat conduction. So let's talk about the Archimedes principle first. 
We have two major kinds of rocks on Earth, which we call felsic rock, which contains silicates, and you're sitting on one. This is a craton. This is a continent. This is a craton. F first order, the rock type is it's, uh, it's granite. And you'd think granite is heavy, but it's comparatively light, and it floats, which is why we're above water. There's another type of rock called mafic rock, which is basalt. And that's what the ocean crust is. Now, if I put a candle under the stable craton or put a candle under the, the basalt, the heat conduction through the basalt is approximately an order of magnitude faster than the heat conduction through the craton. So now the craton is feeling heat under it. And after a while, it'll start to crack. This is the simple idea. And as it cracks, it'll fill in the distance between these two new cratons, cratonets, with basalt. Okay, so that's the early process that's going on here. Now, they move away and move away and move away, and you would think maybe that California is going to join China, but that's not what's going to happen. We're going back to France. So what happens is, after a while, we get to a point where the basalt is getting colder and further away and closer to a craton that's cold, and it starts to subduct. And this is the beginning of what we call an active margin. So in the Atlantic Ocean is still what in this position. It's called a, a passive margin. There's no subduction on either the western or eastern boundaries of the Atlantic Ocean. In the Pacific Ocean, there's subduction, as you know. And there's uplift of material as the subduction occurs, bringing material onto the craton, taking it out of the Wilson cycle. So I'm taking organic matter and I'm putting it up on land, in mountains. And when these two continents back collide, you have collision orogenies and make huge mountains, and we store a huge amount of organic matter in rocks. And that's the lockbox. Now, I'm just going to point this out. There was one condition here. Oops. It's not going. Sorry. Here it goes. <sighs> so we had a bowl in this bowl in the Archean and Proterozoic Ocean that up until approximately 2.4 billion years ago, a little bit into the early Proterozoic, the world had no oxygen. And then all of a sudden, the bowl went into the second bowl where we have oxygen and we'll never go back. We will never, ever go back. We'll never go back as long as there's life on Earth to a planet without oxygen. It's a second stable state. So. <clears throat> To maintain high concentrations, you need two processes. You need a mechanism of splitting water, and you need a way to store the organic matter. And the organic matter, I'm going to show you where it is. This is the sugar. It's in black shales. There it is. All over the planet. Up on land, not in the ocean. So if we didn't have continents, we would never have high levels of oxygen. Now I'm going to finish this part of it off in a very funny way, just before I get into the molecular stuff. This is a distribution of phosphate in the world's ocean. And when the sun is shining, normally organisms in the ocean will take up all the nutrients in the world. And I show you that phosphate is very limiting. Uh, but here's the eastern equatorial Pacific, the subarctic Pacific, and the southern ocean. They have huge amounts of phosphate even when the sun is shining. The late John Martin, who worked at Moss Landing Marine Lab near Monterey, took from Claire Patterson, who discovered the age of the Earth by using clean techniques. He discovered how to do this. He used clean techniques, and he measured iron with ultra-clean techniques in the ocean. For the very first time, he published the paper in 1988 in Nature. And he said, we overestimated iron concentrations by at least an order of magnitude. So this is the Pacific Ocean, the open Pacific. The iron concentrations are less than 100 picomolar in the surface waters. So this was an interesting observation. 
By the way, manganese is also uh, limiting or very low, but it's never limiting. So where does iron come from? So the iron distribution to the ocean in the modern world is from dust. Winds are picking up basically gl glacial till. In this case, the Sahil, but in the Gobi Desert, they're picking this up. They're picking this up from Australia and blowing it out into the ocean where it settles, and some of it becomes solubilized and is used as a source of iron for metabolism. And why is that interesting? Well, because we have an asymmetry in continental distributions at the moment with most of the continents in the northern hemisphere, very few in the southern hemisphere. So the fluxes of iron in the northern hemisphere are much greater than the fluxes of iron in the southern hemisphere. Hence, we have a huge iron problem in the Southern Ocean, which is a very, very important ocean. And I'm just going to show you this for fun. Um, this is a Southern Ocean iron fertilization experiment. So we're going to see. This is chemistry on a scale that's a little different from what uh, you guys do in the chemistry department. So uh, these are the tanks of ferrous sulfate we're putting on a ship in Christchurch. We're going to go down to the Southern Ocean. We've done 14 of these experiments. We collectively, the, collectively, the world has done 14 of these experiments. These are now not going to be funded anymore by the National Science Foundation for reasons that I can go into. Here we are at sea, and now we're going to do the mix master. We're going to take this iron sulfate, and it's been distributed into these, uh, these smaller bottles. Very cool. So we're just dumping this in. We're going to add a tracer of sulfur hexafluoride, which is not made by nature. So you can trace this material in the water. Okay, you dissolve it. And then we have a very expensive delivery system. It costs about $50 from Costco. Uh, and this is it. This is iron fertilization. We're going to dump the iron off the fantail of the ship. It is a lead weight so that the hose stays at a certain depth in the water. And we're just going to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Does any, I, I'm going to cut this off because of the interest of time if you want to go look at this. So this is what we do. We go up and down and up and down like you're mowing a lawn. So it's seven kilometers, approximately by seven kilometer box. And you know the time you started, you know the time you end, and we're starting now to come back into the system with a sampling machine, so sampling system. So these diamonds are outside of the iron fertilization, and then we come in and you see circles and squares and, and triangles and so on. So we know exactly what the time was when that iron has been put into the ocean, and so you know the duration of that. And what we can do is we can measure the photosynthetic processes. And in this particular case, we use a very simple fluorescence tool. I'm not going to go into details, but within 24 hours after the addition of iron, the photosynthetic rates go up by a factor of two. So the iron has biochemically, physiologically limited the ability of the cell to absorb solar energy and to use it to make sugar or candy. Now, I studied this process for many years. I got, when I got to Think about this. How does this relate to all of metabolism across the tree of life? We put together these kind of Venn diagrams. And I started to think about this. And I said, nah, that does, that's not a very appealing way to think about how photosynthesis works and how respiration works. There must be some other way. And I, I sat with my friend Tom Fenchel from Denmark and, and later Ed DeLong from MIT then. Um, and I said, let's make a keg diagram of all of the wirings of all of the electron transfers across the tree of life. And this is what we come up with. And you see iron is there. So iron is used as, an, as a source of electrons. It can be oxidized. Sulfur, as sulfate, can be, ox, uh, can be reduced and oxidized. Carbon dioxide, and then you see water. So bottom processes here are the oxidation processes that lead to protons and electrons and are a photosynthesis in general. And then the upper ones are respiratory processes. Now, about 80% of these reactions are controlled by anaerobic microbes. 
And for some of us, it, it's maybe easy, easier to think about this. this. This diagram is actually more complicated than the one I just showed you. But for the students in the room that forgot what electron transfer reactions are, this is a very simple way to think about it. Imagine you're on the London subway, and it's a little crowded in the morning on rush hour. And this actually doesn't happen in London. It happens in Tokyo. And you're starting to get onto the subway, but there's a lot of resistance. So a guy comes behind you with white gloves and pushes you into the train, OK? That's solar energy. He's pushing you into the train. You're making the train full of more electrons. You are an electron. You've just re made the electron system. You've reduced the train. You get to the next stop. Electrons get out, and they can do some work. They're going to work, OK? That's oxidizing the train. You got it? So when you put something on with an electron, that's a reduction. When you take the electron off, it's an oxidation. It can be coupled with or without a proton. Moving a proton by itself, putting more hydrogen protons onto a train and taking the hydrogen off the train, that's acid-base chemistry. That's not photo, that's not redox chemistry. So I hope you remember, if you think about yourself as an electron, whether you're oxidizing or reducing the system. Now, here's the story. That map that I showed you, I wrote in science, when we wrote that paper, there were 1,500 core genes. That's wrong. My student, Ben Yellen, annotated that very carefully. There are 396. That's it. 396 genes that move all the electrons across the tree of life, 140 of them are in pho oxygenic photosynthesis. So the rest of them are in different areas of metabolism. Now I, you know, keep it simple, stupid. So I think about this as an electrical engineer might think about it. This, you have this metabolism. It's a circuit board on a planetary scale. You have one power supply, the sun. You have two wires, just two the atmosphere, and the ocean. So you're sitting in this room in Davis. You're breathing oxygen. The oxygen may or may not have been made today in California. But even if I put you in Antarctica in the austral winter, the sun is not shining. You're going to breathe oxygen. It's not like when the sun goes away for six months. <gasps> you, OK? So you don't, you don't suffocate. Why? Because the oxygen is mixed from places where it was sourced to places where it sinks globally. So that's one wire system is the atmosphere. The second major wire system is the ocean. So you have two wires, one power supply, and then you have 396 transistors and diodes on the, on the circuit. So what are those transistors and diodes? So we're now going to talk about the very, very simple ones. And we're going to very, very quickly go through this. So structurally, we're going to talk about sequences, which is the primary structure of amino acids within a protein, and the fold, the secondary and tertiary structures that make that, or even quaternary structures, that make that protein function. And I'm just going to point out there was a very famous paper by Rick Eck and, and Margaret Dayhoff in 1966, Margaret Dayhoff, for those of you who don't know, Margaret Dayhoff was the, the, really the founder of bioinformatics. She was a computer scientist who invented the single letter amino acid code because she was coding on Fortran cards. And when you had to write three letters on a Fortran card, it took three times more effort than if you just wrote one letter on a Fortran card. Got it? So that's it. So you all, you all heard the problem of why K is uh, an amino acid, and R is an amino acid, and so on. Anyway, they wrote, the processes of natural selection severely inhibit any change in a well-adapted system on which several other essential components depend. So what does this mean, translated into real simple English? It means that the machines, the nanomachines that are moving the electrons around, are basically not undergoing evolution anymore structurally. They're, they're frozen. They're frozen. It's what I call the Microsoft solution. OK? So if you, have, if you wrote 5,000 lines of code in the Archean, 
And now you're at Microsoft 2018, so that's four billion years ago, okay? You're just going to write 555,000 lines more of code to fix the crappy code that you wrote when you didn't understand the operating system very well. That is the Microsoft solution. That's why I don't get any money from Bill Gates. Anyway, um, so let's take a look at the, the components that move the electrons around. So I'm going to take all those transistors that are in the protein data bank, and we know a lot of them. I'm going to ask you, what, what are they doped with? So by far, the largest doper, doping agent, is iron. And it comes in two main flavors. There's iron, iron sulfur clusters, and that's up there, about 25% of it. And then about the rest, or 43 or so percent, are in hemes. So you know hemes. That's one, your blood is red. Well, heme means red. <clears throat> and then we come to the next most abundant transition metal is copper, followed by manganese, nickel, molybdenum, and a little, little, little bit of vanadium. And some of those are artifacts. There's a little bit of tungsten that is used. It's actually found only in hydrothermal vent organisms. And those folds are highly conserved. So here's one of those folds, the most famous one of the most famous folds of the 10 superfold families. The nanomachine of this fold, this is a ferrodoxin fold that's found in many things. It's a cysteine, XX cysteine, XX cysteine. So you see the iron and the sulfur in this four, iron four sulfur cluster in the center. And while we're at it, for those of you not structural biologists, you see two main types of secondary structures here, these helices and this little spaghetti. So if you are interested in secondary structure, you need to only know three pieces of pasta. Okay? You need to know spaghetti, rotini, that's the, the, the twirly one, okay, and lasagna. Okay? If you can remember those three pieces of pasta, you could be a structural biologist. You're just going to mix them in different ways, and you're going to make proteins, OK? They should be soft, though, al dente. All right, so this is a repetition of another fold. This is nitrogenase, the core of the nitrogenase. There's one man, uh, molybdenum there. But the point is this, now you see that this basic motif has been repeated and repeated and repeated. Now, in this case, we're having histidines instead of just cysteines binding to the, to the protein. And now we're going to move electrons from N2 gas on to make ammonia. And here's another one, superoxide dismutase. This one potentially has, this one has copper. There are four flavors, at least, of superoxide dismutase. I just want to make a note here about superoxide dismutase. When we made oxygen, that was one of the most toxic gases that could be made. We could have been making one more toxic gas, and it's, you, know, you could think about we could have chlorine as a gas. There's lots of chloride in the ocean. We could have made chlorine gas, and we would have had a little bit more whoop. Okay. Now, but when you make superoxides, or reactive oxygen species in general, peroxides, that's really bad. And why I'm saying this, if you are running, if you're doing aerobic exercise, you're killing yourself. Don't. Don't do that. <laughs> OK? You're just destroying your bodies. Let it be. You know, just <laughs> relax. OK, and then we have this. Now, here's the story. I, that same John Kim that I showed you before who did that study of the Siderite, he had a really interesting idea. It was very naive at the beginning. I thought it wouldn't work, but it, it was really interesting. He said, I'm going to take the secondary structures, and there's a, a mechanism to do this, which I'm not going to go into in bioinformatics, and I'm going to go 15 angstroms out from the secondary structure of the, of the metals in the metal clusters only for the oxidoreductases of the transfer electrons and without protons. And so I'm going to put everyone into either a 100% uh, loop, that's the top of this isosceles triangle, 100% helix down here, or 100% sheet. So that's 100% spaghetti, 100% rotini, 100% lasagna, OK? And every one of those dots in there is certainly a name for a pasta in Italy. In any event, once you do that, you can take now and draw from every dot to every other dot, and those are protein structures, 
a Euclidean distance. And once you can form a Euclidean distance, we can make a tree in structure land. I don't care where the organism is. I don't know the organism. I have no, I don't care about organisms. I, as you know, it's the genes. It's not the organism. Organisms are ephemeral. They come and they go. As long as, you, as somebody remembers to make nitrogenase, you're OK. We don't, in biology, we worship organisms. I think we should just think about the genes. Anyway, Rick, we can have this conversation later. Um, so let's just take a look at this map in hydrogen space. So this is hydrogen bonding space. So the top of the map is a very, very, very wobbly type of structure. Very, very few hydrogen bonds. Most, that is the most evolvable space. Once you get down to these bottom two corners, you have huge numbers of hydrogen bonds, very stiff. So let me explain to you what this means. Nitrogenase has a lot of spaghetti in it. It's looser. It can fix nitrogen gas. It can fix acetylene. It, can, it, it, it doesn't care in many ways. If I take your cytochrome C oxidase, which has a copper in it and is relatively stiff, and I'll show you that in a second, if I take OO, that works. You can reduce the oxygen with cytochrome oxidase to, to get the oxygen to accept the electrons and protons. If I take a CO, it's still a linear molecule, no charge, one very, very small minor change, you're dead. It locks into the pocket. OK. So that's the difference with hydrogen bonds. It's promiscuity of substrate, the first order. So here is the tree. The very, very top is that paradoxin fold. That's the CXXC. There, it leads to an iron hydrogenase, which leads now to this sheet clades. And now you will see a whole bunch of proteins in the sheet clades and a whole bunch of proteins in the uh, helix clade. So that's the lasagna clade, and this is the rotini clade. And now we come up to the cytochrome C oxidase, cytochrome C oxidase. These contain copper in this particular case. These are some of the last evolved proteins on Earth. Now, as one eukaryote to another, I'm speaking frankly now, right? We can talk. One eukaryote to another. We are very boring. We just breathe oxygen. We can't breathe nitric oxide. We die. We breathe nitrous oxide and we laugh. But you can't live on it. OK? So from a metabolic point of view, we almost all eukaryotes, with very few exceptions, are totally irrelevant metabolically on the planet. All of those great metabolisms were involved, evolved in prokaryotes. Now, I'm going to finish this lecture up, the Legos of life story here. Um, we became very interested in not just the structures of these big proteins, but what were the substructures? What were the Legos that made these structures? And so we looked at all these big molecules, and many of them have wires of iron sulfur clusters. Many of them have other kinds of, uh, of, of motifs in them. And we broke them up into these modules. And we classified them. So there were about 1,000 modules that we could identify. And then we do a neural net a network. And for example, we find four major modules, the symmetron, then the center of the folds, the paradoxin, and symmetron, and cytochrome C is another one containing iron, ultimately leading to a plastocyanin fold, one containing copper. So the numbers of Legos actually is pretty small. So we don't have 400 transistors in the box. We actually only have about 12. So with those 12 transistors, you can make all the circuit diagram that you need, all the you can make anything you want. So this is, um, this is what was published. So you can see the bacterial paradoxin, for example, to the symmetrin, 
symmetrin, which uh, Andy Karplus works on at Oregon State and so on, cytochrome C, many people work on this, sign and pulse. This is the Lego set. None of this is done by genetics. None of this is done by sequence analysis. This is all structures. So there appear to be only 12 core structural motifs in all the electron transfer reactions in nature. One power supply, two wires, 12 core structures. That makes the erector set very, very simple. Very simple. Now, I'm going to finish this off. This is uh, my penultimate slide. So we took this ferredoxin, which is the structure up here. This is the natural ferredoxin. It contains about 60 amino acids in a gene duplication event. That's what Ekin Dayhoff reported on in 1966. We said, what's the simplest electron transfer reaction we can use within a 4 iron 4 sulfur cluster? So we designed, uh, we didn't design, Vic Nanda designed with Doug Pike, a structure which contains alternating L and D amino acids of two flavors. In this particular case, it's cysteine and aspartic acid. So cysteine, cysteine. so you have an L, D, L, D, L, D, L, D, L, D, 12 amino acids making this almost ring. It doesn't completely form a ring. And we insert the iron sulfur clusters. And I'm not going to go through the EPR because Dave is here. But um, this is the cyclic voltammetry. You can go thousands of cycles, and it moves electrons. So you can make very, 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 very simple structures. What are we trying to do? What's our goal here? Well, we're trying to make ferrodo I mean, to make hydrogenases with very simple structures, and um, we can make transistors truly. So this is a Y protein, which has six iron sulfur clusters. And I don't want to bother you with this, but the iron sulfur clusters are configured within the protein design to be within what's called the Dutton-Moser ruler. So they're, they're closer than 15 angstroms, so they can actually transfer electrons, except for the top part of the Y, where the Y goes like this. We don't want the electrons to go from the left-handed lower iron sulfur cluster to the right-handed one. If I don't want it to do that, I can design it very, very nicely so that electron transfer doesn't happen. And I can make a transistor. Now, so that's good. That's fun. We are really, really trying to make very, very simple iron sulfur cluster containing nickel that will be a hydrogenase. And ultimately, we think we can couple that to a totally artificial peptide that will be, I hope, a nitrogenase. So I'm trying to re-engineer, reverse engineer those 396 proteins with the Lego set to try to understand the evolution of metabolism. So let me finish this up. I've already gone on too long. The first two and a half billion years of Earth's history was the research and development program. That's when the operating system was formed. All of the key metabolic processes were developed in prokaryotes. Not a single original thing occurred in eukaryotes, not one. So if you're studying plants and animals, think about it. <laughs> there are approximately only 400 core metabolic genes that make all the electrons flow across the planet. And these sequences are coupled on local and planetary scales to facilitate an electron market. That's really what they do. So if you found one bug on Mars, it's not doing anything. It has no partner. There's no metabolic process to, con to complete the cycle. And in the modern world, and it's been for a very, very, very long time, and we don't know how we got this, the contemporary electronic potential is driven totally by light, which I find fascinating. So. Um, we can talk about hydrothermal vents. We can talk about a lot of things. But at the end of the day, the sunshine is converted into electron transfer reactions. And when you take out of your wallet a credit card or a piece of paper with a picture of a president or a queen, ask yourself, what am I buying? You go into the store, you're buying food, electrons. You're going to the car, you're buying gasoline, electrons. You're plugging your computer in 
and you're going on the internet, electrons. You are using an artificial currency to buy either stored or promptly conserved solar energy to make electrons, which is pretty interesting. Okay, so anyway, thank you very, very much. I, that, thank you for your attention. Could do worse. Um, so this is the, um, the original idea of John Martin. So John Martin, when he thought about this, he said uh, very famously, give me a tanker full of iron and I'll give you an ice age. We call this the Geritol solution. Um, Gerit, they don't know what Geritol is. Geritol was, was a supplement for old people for you would drink your iron, okay? So to keep you from aging. Um, <laughs> probably. I think they took it off the market. Anyway, um, there's only one ocean in which you can do that, and that's the Southern Ocean for oceanographic, physical oceanographic reasons, because it's the only place where you upwell the nutrients all the time and the material will sink. Now, this is what happened when the simulations were done originally. You could remove carbon dioxide this way, for sure. Ken Caldera, who was then at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and is now at the Carnegie Institute of Washington down at Stanford at the plant uh, in the Ecology Center, um, is a very, very good modeler. He, uh, he really did a very careful simulation of what happens after 1,000 years. Now, if you start to sink this organic matter, it starts to make pockets of hypoxia and anoxia. So instead of oxidizing this back to CO2, you oxidize it only to, or you convert it only to methane and nitrous oxide, two greenhouse gases that are far more potent per molecule than carbon dioxide. When you start to outgas this stuff, you've actually put more greenhouse gas in the atmosphere a 1,000 years from now than you actually took out of the atmosphere in CO2. So it's a ticking time bomb. So almost all of us realize that this is not the best way to do this. So if you want to ameliorate the carbon dioxide emissions to the atmosphere in a geoengineering way. And I was on the National Academy review of this. The worst thing you could do, this isn't the worst thing. That's not the worst thing. The worst thing you could do is to spritz the atmosphere with sulfur dioxide or sulfates to, to reflect light back to space. Why is that really bad? So this was Edward Teller's, Edward Teller's idea when he was head of, uh, of Los Alamos. He convinced Reagan, we don't have to worry about global warming. We can always make the planet cooler by putting sulfur molecules into the stratosphere. And that's true. However, if you do that and keep emitting carbon dioxide, you've masked the effect of the forcing of the carbon dioxide on climate. And if in a few years a country decides, I don't want to do this anymore, and you stop putting the sulfate in, then instead of having a slow glide up in, time, in temperature, you'll have a step function. So the temperature will rise by two or three degrees centigrade instantly, instantly. So that's the worst. The most gracious way of doing this, to start, if you're going to use fossil fuels at all, um, is to remove the, 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 the CO2 from stack gases, because that's where it's most concentra concentrated, it's cheapest. You lose about presently 20% efficiency in a coal fire or gas fire power plant if you do that. So you have to burn 20 to 20 25% more fossil fuel. But you can recover the CO2 and liquefy it. And you can store it. Actually, it's best to store it under the ocean because you have a very high pressure. It's very, very, very unlikely to come back to you in aquifers under the ocean. So that is one mechanism of doing this. Ultimately, ultimately, um, you know, at some point, Dave or Chuck Dismukes or Gary Brudvig or somebody is going to figure out how to split water with just a, a, a earth abundant catalyst like iron or manganese, something that's really simple. Some kid in, the, in his, his lab at two in the morning is going to have an aha moment. And when that happens, we'll totally have changed 
the way we derive energy on the planet. We'll just get the hydrogen directly. Hydrogen isn't a fuel. It's, a, it's an energy carrier. But once you do that, you can have a tremendous, tremendous profound effect. So think about how crazy this is. Think about this. In 1859, Edwin Drake went to, he was a conductor on a train. That's what his job was. A bunch of people convinced him to go to Titusville, Pennsylvania, because he was some, knew some engineering. And in Titusville, he started to drill wells for oil. And what was this trick? He just lined the well with, with, with pipe. And the first few times he did this, nothing happened. It was called Drake's Folly. But finally, he hit oil. Now, petroleum is petroleum, right? Petroleum, rock oil. That had been known for centuries. Greeks knew about it. But to get it out of the ground was another story. So here's Drake. He drills it. He gets some oil. What do you do with oil in 1859? Think about this. 1859, what do you do with oil? <laughs> right. So, so this is what happens. So they distill the oil, and they make kerosene. And then in Brooklyn, a guy named Robert Dietz redesigns the blubber-fed oil lamps of the country to burn very efficiently, smokelessly, kerosene. And all of a sudden, Dietz becomes the Steve Jobs of his day. He sells millions of these damn things. He's a multi-multi-millionaire. And by the by, um, <clears throat> Drake became a pauper. He was bought out, and then that was bought out by the Rockefellers and becomes Standard Oil. OK? So, <clears throat> so 26 Wall Street becomes a big building, and Rockefellers become huge. Now, what made the Rockefellers rich was not the kerosene per se. In 1874, approximately, Daimler, with buddies, figured out how to make an internal combustion engine. And they used a byproduct of the distillate that was thrown away and burned, which now we call gasoline. So now you had a cheap source of energy. So all of a sudden, by 1875 or so, to 1910, we built out in this country and in Europe infrastructure for delivering this liquid, for making the engines, for making the engines cheaply, for making roads. I mean, we did this within 50 years. It was incredible. And now we're sitting there saying, oh, we can't get out of fossil fuels. You can get out of fossil fuels. It's, a, it's, a, it's not just technological. It's a societal issue. And, um, in any event, it's going to happen, and somebody's going to split water, and somebody's going to find other ways of doing this, and we're going to have alternative energies that are going to be carbon-free, and I hope we never have to do the geoengineering uh, of putting something into space. Uh, and I certainly, I, I don't think we should be doing iron fertilization to make a very, very long answer to a very short question. <laughs> you don't want to ask me any more questions. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on what you mean by too fast. So the geological processes. Uh -huh. I got it. Um, the big invention here was the invention of uh, mitochondrial respiration. Uh, that happened only once. Once. So uh, I am sure that there were many, many, many unsuccessful attempts to reverse the electron transfer reactions in the alpha proteobacteria, and they just died. The reason I started to think about this is um, when you grow uh, Rhodopseudomonas viridis or Rhodopseudomonas, uh, any, any of the, the, the Rhodopseudomonas clade, the purple non-sulfur bacteria, and you put them in oxygen, they don't die. They just become heterotrophs. 
Okay? They don't become photosynthetic anymore. Um, so you didn't have to engineer anything in them, or in effect. They be, uh, so that, I, I don't think the oxygen would have killed life. I think the oxygen would have forced a, maybe a minor or set of extinctions, but um, there are always places on the planet which are going to be anaerobic that pr preserve these things, uh, these metabolisms. It's not like we oxidized the planet and all these organisms went away. They're still there. They're in refugia. Okay? Thank you very much.